Yes, we're starting on time today. Isn't that lovely? No. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little video again while we wait for the rest of the uh, people to join us. So here we go. The product of millions of years of evolution, the human body is capable of many remarkable things, but none of which may be quite so incredible as the development of life in utero. Over three million babies are born each year in the United States alone. Worldwide, the highest fertility rate is found in Niger, where the average woman gives birth to approximately 6.49 children in her lifetime. Singapore sits on the opposite end of the spectrum at just 0.83, less than one woman. While the number of births, customs, and traditions vary from culture to culture, the developmental process is essentially universal. Derived from the Latin word pregnantum, meaning before birth, pregnancy is the period in which the fetus develops inside the womb. Typically lasting around 40 weeks, human pregnancies are divided into three trimesters of three months each. Pregnancy begins in the uterus, where a sperm fertilizes an egg. If the sperm carries an X chromosome, the baby will become female, while a Y chromosome will result in the baby becoming male. The fertilized egg, or zygote, divides repeatedly as it travels through the fallopian tube, implanting itself on the uterine wall to form both the embryo and a specialized organ known as the placenta. Found only in eutherian or placental mammals, the placenta will manage waste and provide key nutrients, oxygen, and hormones via the umbilical cord. The brain, which will continue to grow and develop throughout the pregnancy, makes up nearly half of the embryo in these early stages. As the eyes, nose, ears, and mouth, along with all major organs, continue to develop in month three, the baby will begin to look more and more human with each passing day. The second trimester lasts from weeks 13 through 27. The fetus will more than double in size during this time, and soon its movements may be felt by the mother. Hearing first develops around week 18, but the fetus will not respond to sounds outside of the womb until approximately week 25. Starting at week 28 and lasting up until delivery, the third trimester is a time for final touches such as eyelashes and taste buds. With most major development complete, the fetus will gain nearly half a pound a week. To make room for this rapid growth, the mother's internal organs adjust significantly throughout the pregnancy. Dropping lower into the pelvis, a fetus typically turns heads down in preparation for birth. Most bones will have hardened by this time, though the skull will remain relatively soft to ease the delivery process. Labor is divided into stages, beginning with the dilation of the cervix and resulting in the delivery of both the baby and the placenta. Despite thousands of years of human pregnancies, scientific understanding has only recently begun to catch up, leading to an increase in success and safety for both mother and child. As our understanding of pregnancy continues to develop, so do technology and reproductive medicine, with much more in store for the future of pregnancy. Hi, I hope everybody's joining us. Good morning. Welcome back. And um, today we're going to deal with pregnancy in birth. Um, I hope that we have answered all of your questions. And um, this, for many of you, will, again, like I said, be a reminder of things that you did in family life. Uh -huh. and yeah. in junior okay. school, uh, and for those of you who yeah, also okay. did health science. Then, uh, um, it's really important that you understand uh, how your reproductive organs uh, work yeah. and the process of pregnancy. All right. nice. Reproduction as a whole uh, yeah. is a large percentage of the BGCSE exam. Um, but when they say reproduction, they mean asexual reproduction, um, sexual reproduction in flowering plants, asexual reproduction in flowering plants. 
um, human reproduction as well as genetics. But they are a large chunk of the, um, the syllabus and the exam. Morning again. Um, we're starting. So um, as usual, I showed the video. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll show it again for those people who join later. And um, so we'll go on to our usual PowerPoint presentation. I'm, I have sent the previous lessons to be uploaded. So I'm hoping this one will soon join the, the others. Here we go. Slideshow. Fertilization, implantation, and pregnancy. You know this lovely diagram as usual. All of our sperm swarming the egg and little fetus inside its amniotic sac. So our objectives are to describe copulation and ejaculation, to explain fertilization and implantation, and describe briefly embryo development and pregnancy. Who remembers what this picture is? Yeah, that's the head disappearing, leaving the tail on the outside of the egg. So like most animals, humans reproduce sexually and male and female gametes to join to form a single cell zygote, which will develop into a new individual. Remember, a zygote is a single cell and it is a cell formed on the joining of the male gamete and the female gamete. Same thing happens in flowering plants when you have the male gamete and the female gamete in sexual reproduction. So gametes are the male or female reproductive cell. And in humans, they contain 23 chromosomes. The number of chromosomes in an individual varies from organism to organism. For example, the fruit fly, I think, has four pairs. So each contains 23 chromosomes, or the haploid number, which they use right as N, which is half the total number, or the diploid number, full set of chromosomes. Chromosomes carry traits from both parents. So the male sex, the male gamete, will have half the total number. So sperm are haploid cells, and eggs, the ova, are also haploid cells, having half the number. And here's a picture of eggs surrounded by sperm, and then you see a sperm, which has the acrosome at the top, which contains enzymes, which will help penetrate um, the wall of the egg. You have the nucleus, which contains your genetic material, your chromosomes, and this midpiece or neck contains the mitochondria, which provides energy that it needs to swim. And of course, the tail is a propulsion system that helps it to swim. Fertilization is a union of a sperm and an egg to form a diploid zygote. So you have your haploid sperm and your haploid egg forming a diploid zygote. Sperm and egg even zygote. 23 plus 23 gives 46. N plus N to N. The human reproductive process begins when a man ejaculates sperm into a woman's vagina during sexual intercourse. So the human reproductive process begins when a man ejaculates sperm into a woman's vagina during sexual intercourse. In your exam, please use the term sexual intercourse or copulation or mating. Do not use the words that you commonly use with your friends and um, on the streets. Um, scientific terms for a science exam. Okay, so Sexual intercourse, copulation, mating. Why you talking about, um, when a man becomes sexually excited, his penis becomes erect and stiff. Because it is erect and stiff, the penis can be inserted into the vagina and the movement causes ejaculation. Um, there are there's something called erectile tissue in the penis. It becomes engorged with blood, causing the organ to stiffen. So the penis becomes firm and rigid. The three cylinders of spongy erectile tissue in the penis become filled with blood or engorged. This happens when a male is aroused. Semen, 
contains 300 to 500 million sperm in five milliliters or a teaspoonful. Uh, it also contains nutrients, enzymes, and secretions from the prostate gland, make it alkali to neutralize acid in a female. Semen allows for sperm to survive for a couple of days inside the female's body. Contractions of muscles surrounding the urethra and the penis expels the semen into the vagina. Ejaculation is accompanied by a pleasurable feeling called an orgasm. Some sperm may exit the penis before ejaculation occurs. So you can have pregnancy without penetration. In other words, without the penis actually entering the vagina, pregnancy may occur because some sperm, so um, if the head of the penis is anywhere around the vaginal area and you have some pre-ejaculate, you can have some sperm swimming. Remember, sperm can swim. So the moisture from the vagina, the moisture in the ejaculate, the sperm will be able to swim, even without penetration. Therefore, sexual activity does not involve it. Sexual activity that does not involve ejaculation could also lead to the release of sperm from the vagina, fertilization, and pregnancy. Sperm can swim. Now, sperm may go in any direction. Um, they're just swimming wildly. But only one of these directions leads to an egg. Um, sperm are attacked by females' white blood cells, and many sper sperm die due to the acid environment in the females. In the female, that is why so many are produced to raise the chances of getting through. Remember, three hundred to five hundred million in a teaspoon. So, because of all this hostility against the sperm, they have to have so many millions of them to increase the chances of survival. Surviving sperm use their flagella or the tail to swim through the mucus lining of the uterus and up the fallopian tube or, or oviduct. When they reach the egg, the sperm surrounds it and they release an enzyme which breaks down the protein in the egg's outer covering. Many sperm are needed to produce enough enzymes. So even though only one sperm is going to eventually get in to help to break down the um, outer covering, you need the enzymes from many sperm. As soon as a single, oops, sorry. As soon as a single sperm gets through the covering, once the head of a single sperm penetrates the membrane of the egg, fuses with the sperm. Next, the sperm's flagellum and mitochondria break down. So, um, the mitochondria that you have is only your mother's mitochondria, DNA. Um, and at this point, the sperm is only a nucleus. This explains why all mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the mother. So here's a pathway to fertilization. You have insemination occurring here. In other words, where um, you have the ejaculate semen as an ejaculate, and the sperm passes here, up the fallopian, goes up, swims up the lining of the vagina wall and into the fallopian tube where it meets the egg. The sperm will swarm around the egg. The head of the egg of the sperm enters the egg and a new membrane forms to prevent further entry of the sperm. And you have fertilization. Fertilization is when a sperm and egg nuclear form to form zygote. The zygote begins to divide as it travels towards the uterus. A fertilized egg then begins a three to five day journey toward the fallopian, down the fallopian tube. During the journey, the zygote undergoes many mitotic divisions. And remember in meiosis, your um, division give you half the number of the parent cell. In mitosis, the um, daughter cells have the same number of chromosomes as a parent cell. So you get cells divided into two, then four, then so on. 
by the time it reaches the uterus is an embryo that looks like a ball of cell of cells. So after the fifth day, we no longer we call it the tiny ball of cells, the embryo. In implantation, the tiny embryo becomes embedded in the lining of the uterus. Implantation is only successful, is successful only about 30% of the time. Implantation occurs when the fertilized egg sinks into the thickened uterine lining. The outer covering of the embryo produces a small cavity in the lining of the uterus. Um, let's stop here and see if I can answer if you have questions. Are there any questions for me? Okay, the um, question we have so far is um, how do people have twins? Um, we'll get on into that a little later, but um, there's two ways of twins occurring. Um, when you have the original zygote, once it divides into two cells, those two cells separate and start developing as individuals. So that's, those will be your fraternal twins. Another way is when there are two different eggs present and each egg is fertilized by a different sperm. And that's where you have your fraternal twins. Any other questions before we go back? If I'm going too fast, please let me know. And like I said, the, the PowerPoint will be uploaded. So there's no more questions, so I'll continue. So implantation occurs when fertilized egg sinks into the outer uterine lining. The outer covering of the embryo produces a small cavity in the lining of the uterus. The embryo starts to secrete the hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. HCG. Um, remember, gonads are your sex organs. Now, the, the presence of this hormone is what they is what's used um, to detect pregnancy in pregnancy tests. So, once the embryos stop, once you have implantation occurring, then this hormone is produced, and you can confirm pregnancy by the presence of this hormone. The purpose of this hormone is to keep the corpus luteum alive. Now remember when we talked, when we talked about um, development, you had the follicle, and once the follicle released the egg um, at ovulation, what you had remaining of the follicle is your corpus luteum. And the corpus, one of the functions of the corpus luteum is to secrete progesterone, which um, helps maintain the lining of the uterus, um, keeps the uterine lining built up. And it is the HCG that helps um, the corpus luteum to um, not degenerate and break down. Conception. Um, fertilization and conception are not the, the same thing. Conception is, is considered um, from conception is, con is considered from the time when the um, when implantation occurs, which, as we said, is three to five days after actual fertilization. So, consent conception is a time at which the fertilized egg implants itself in the uterine wall. The placenta. Once an embryo is implanted in the uterus, the placenta begins to grow. Um, the placenta is, I guess, generated is a good word, by both the embryo and the maternal tissues. The purpose of the placenta is to supply food and oxygen from the mother's blood into the embryo. This is a very, very common BGCSE question. They ask you, to name two substances that pass from the mother's blood to the developing embryo. And that would be your 
food and oxygen. It contains a network of blood vessels that links the embryo to the mother by way of the umbilical cord. As the embryo develops, membranes form to protect and nourish the embryo. Two of these, membr two of these membranes are the amnion and the chorion. Embryo is a term used to describe an egg from the time of implantation to the eighth week of development. So you have your zygote, which divides into many cells, a ball of cells which is your embryo, but it's also an embryo up until the eighth week. And it's really tiny. It's about seven millimeters at eight weeks. It's only about seven meters long seven millimeters long, which is, I guess, the size of a raisin? Nah, smaller than a raisin. I'll have, to look, I'll have to measure it. By this time, all the major organs are formed, not fully formed, but they are formed. After eight weeks, the term fetus is used up until birth. The amnion develops into a fluid develops into a fluid-filled amniotic sac. And the, first, the purpose of this amnion and the fluid inside it is to cushion and protect the baby. The baby. Um, Finger-like projections called chorionic villi form an outer surface of chorion and extend into the uterine lining. So you have this chorionic villus extending in to your, your uterine lining. So here you have your umbilical cord and in the umbilical cord, there are two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. You have maternal arteries and maternal vein. Now notice that the mother's blood and the child's blood do not come into direct contact. Um, their blood fills these spaces around and the mother's blood, the baby's blood is enclosed in, enclosed in these tubes. There's no direct sharing of blood. Um, materials diffuse from the mother's blood into the baby's and from the baby's blood back out into the mother's. Um, we use the term gestation, which is pregnancy. Um, it begins at conception and continues in, until birth. So pregnancy in humans usually lasts about 280 days, between 38 and 42 weeks, and is calculated from the first day of the mother's period. Um, it's very rare for women to know their ovulation date. They will more likely know when their period began. So the counting is take, the count when they start visiting their doctor is taken for the date of their last period. So after three months, most of the major organs are formed and just this time the umbilical cord also forms. The umbilical cord connects the fetus to the placenta. A later development, now fortunately for us, uh, the development of the fetus is not a part of our syllabus, but it seems a little weird to just skip from, hey, I'll feed us now, to talking straight about birth. So for our general information, four to six months after fertilization, the heart can be heard with a stethoscope. Bone replaces cartilage that forms the early skeleton. A soft layer of hair grows over the fetus skin. And during this time too, the fetus grows and the mother can feel it moving. During the last three months, the organ systems appear, the fetus doubles in mass, and it can now regulate its own body temperature. The central nervous system and lungs are completely developed. Human development from conception is divided into three trimesters. The first trimester is the first three months, and the most rapid changes occur here. Um, so we go from this tadpole looking thing to a bigger tadpole looking thing that looks more like a baby. In the second trimester, 
you have an increase in the size of fetus and a general refinement of the human features. And then you have in the third trimester, you have this massive growth and preparation for birth. That gray thing you can see there is your umbilical cord. Now, we're not going to talk about birth today. No, no. Um, so the fetus is, what's the baby that, is what the baby is called um, after that period of time. It's the fetus. Um, and a fetus already has all of the organs um, in place. Uh, the reason why I don't share the blood, yes, part of it is blood type, but also um, you don't also want you don't want disease organisms passing through either. Nice questions. Any more? Um, can you write? If you want to write, that's fine. But like I said, um, I'm going to have the PowerPoint put on in the resources so you can access it when you want. But I always find, I find for myself personally, it helps me to focus when I take notes. Some people can remember just by listening and by looking, but some people need that um, writing down. So even though you're going to get the, the PowerPoint, it would help to write things down. And I think you'd find it, um, I think you'd find it helpful to jot things down. Even if you can't write every single thing down on the slide, on this, um, you could put in some major, you can put in the, uh, <clears throat> you can put in the, the main points, things you want to remember. You can jot down questions that you may want to ask yourself later. You can turn, some of the um, lines on the PowerPoint, turn them into questions so that when you're studying, you can answer. So once again, no more questions. We straight. This is the second day in a row that there have not been a lot of questions. That makes me nervous. And like I said, could you put your Put your um, put the questions in the chat. I find it easier to manage than the um, uh, the umbilical cord um, goes to the placenta, which is basically somebody described me want as a plate shaped organ. Um, so the plate shape this it's sort of shaped like a plate is not it's not um it's not flat like a disc i guess it is but it's um the so the umbilical cord is attached to the placenta um sperm can live i don't want to get this wrong two to three days and uh, the baby doesn't start turning Upside down, upside down as you put it, but head towards the um, op the cervix until um, near the end of the third trimester. Okay, freezing sperm. Um, the sperm itself isn't frozen. Um, they could they freeze the semen containing the sperm. And yes, um, they can, that's when we get around to talking about infertility, we will talk about the techniques used to preserve sperm and to preserve embryos too. Any more questions? Oh, uh, we are zipping ahead. I'm gonna show another video that shows the, um, that gives you more detail about um, the role of the, umbilical cord and the placenta. Hopefully that will straighten out some of your, um, your answers. It's not your answers, your questions. <laughs> Hi, this is Tom from zerodefinals.com.
I wanted to make a video today on the function of the placenta and trying to understand exactly how it works to support the fetus while it's growing. So firstly we've got to take a basic look at the placenta. We all know that the baby comes along with an umbilical cord and down that cord you have two umbilical arteries and they carry deoxygenated blood away from the baby and then you have one umbilical vein and that carries all the good oxygenated blood that's full of nutrients away from the placenta and into the baby. Inside the now, placenta... this is something you need to understand. All the time that we've been talking about arteries in the human body, um, we know that arteries carry um, oxygenated blood. But in the, the umbilical arteries carry deoxygenated blood. There's one other place in the human body that carries, where arteries carry deoxygenated blood. If you think about it, think about the circulatory system. Think about blood returning to the heart. Remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart. So your pulmonary artery, which is coming from the heart to the lungs, carrying deoxygenated blood. That is also, and is also a, a, the place where arteries carry deoxygenated blood. But everywhere else, arteries carry oxygenated blood. So these two umbilical water arteries carry deoxygenated blood. And you look at the blue arrow, it goes from the baby to the placenta. And, therefore, and then to the mother's blood. Um, the umbilical vein, on the other hand, has oxygenated blood coming from the mother, from the placenta, from the mother, to the baby. And the umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood. In the rest of the body, veins carry deoxygenated blood except of course the pulmonary vein which comes from the lungs to the heart carrying oxygenated blood and again the umbilical vein carries oxygen from the placenta to the baby you have a bit of a complex network of arteries and veins but they're quite simple once you get your head around them first of all you have the maternal vein and artery inside the placenta and these veins and arteries feed into something called the intervillous space. And what this is, is basically pools of maternal blood. It forms sort of like a lake in which lots of maternal blood is collected, just sitting there waiting to interact with the fetal blood. Now you have the umbilical arteries and the umbilical veins that penetrate and form a sort of tree-like structure within the intervillous space, so inside those pools of blood. And the maternal blood and fetal blood don't actually mix, but they come in very close contact across a thin membrane, and that's known as the placental membrane. So across this placental membrane, lots of things can transfer or diffuse from the maternal blood into the fetal blood and vice versa. And it's this process of diffusion that forms much of the function of the placenta. Let's look at the first function of the placenta, and that's the respiratory function. So because the baby can't actually breathe, it's in a big bath of amniotic fluid, it needs to rely on the placenta to basically act like a pair of lungs. So what does it do? Well, firstly, oxygen needs to transfer from the maternal blood into the fetal blood. And the way it does this is fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than maternal hemoglobin. What this means is, if you put a molecule of maternal or adult haemoglobin next to a molecule of fetal haemoglobin, oxygen will actively transfer from the maternal haemoglobin to the fetal haemoglobin. Just think of the fetal haemoglobin as being more sticky for the oxygen, more attractive for the oxygen. The second respiratory function is that the carbon dioxide that's present in the fetal blood all of this waste carbon dioxide that's generated by the fetus simply diffuses across the placental membrane from the fetal blood into this pool of maternal blood. 
That way the baby can get rid of a lot of the carbon dioxide that it's created. The next function is an excretion function and you can think of this as the placenta acting a bit like a kidney that you'd find in an adult. So what it does is it balances out a lot of the chemicals and molecules that need to be balanced in the blood. Things like bicarbonate, hydrogen ions, lactic acid, urea and creatinine. They can all diffuse across the placental membrane and balance out the okay. babies. This is giving you a lot of detail in terms of what the um, substances are. But for your purposes, you need to know that oxygen diffuses in. Uh, oxygen goes into the baby and your waste materials or your excretory, product, excretory products come from the baby and into and towards the mother. Um, other than perhaps knowing urea, all of those others are not necessary for you to know. But you need to know that urea is one of the waste products, as well as carbon dioxide, of course. Blood, in the same way that a kidney would do in an adult. The next function of the placenta would be the nutrition function. So the baby can't actually eat any food while it's in the womb. So it relies on the mum to eat and create carbohydrates and micronutrients that circulate around the mum's blood and then these diffuse across the placental membrane into the fetal blood and provide the fetus with oxygen and vitamins and micronutrients that it needs to grow. This is one reason it's so important that the mum doesn't become nutrient deficient in say iron or folate or B12 during her pregnancy. So if we find that she's deficient, we'd supplement her with these. The fourth function of the placenta is the immunity function. Now antibodies that the mother has created, her immunity to infections that she's picked up in the past, those antibodies can actually cross the placental membrane and into the fetus. And this is really good news because it protects the baby during the pregnancy from any viruses or bugs that the mum might pick up and also protects the baby shortly after birth. So a really good example of this would be of recurrent genital herpes. Where the mum has had genital herpes several times in the past, she'll have IgG antibodies to that virus. So when she gives birth naturally, even if she has active genital herpes, they won't be passed to the baby because all of those antibodies will have crossed the placenta and will be circulating inside the fetus ready to protect it whenever it comes into contact with that virus in the newborn period. And the final function of the placenta that we need to mention is the endocrine function. This is where the placental tissue itself actually creates hormones that help to maintain the pregnancy. The first hormone that we should mention is human chorionic gonadotrophin or HCG. This hormone is secreted at increasing levels throughout the pregnancy by the cells of the placenta. And what it does is it helps to maintain the corpus luteum until the placenta takes over producing other hormones that maintain the pregnancy. The next hormone the placenta produces is estrogen. And this is important to make everything soft and supple, all of the tissues of the uterus and pelvis, so that they can get stretched during the pregnancy and during birth and delivery. And the final hormone that the placenta produces is progesterone. And it produces progesterone from about five weeks onwards. And the whole point of progesterone is to maintain the pregnancy and keep the uterus nice and relaxed and to keep the endometrium nice and healthy and well perfused so that it's got a great blood supply for the placenta and for the fetus. And that pretty much sums up the respiratory, excretion, nutrition, immunity and endocrine functions of the placenta. So thanks for watching, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads, always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon. Okay. Here we go. Any new questions? Yes. Um, someone has put in that the, um, it's reversed. I suppose um, they're talking about the umbilical vein and the umbilical artery, where the umbilical vein is the one that carries oxygenated blood.
and the umbilical artery carries deoxygenated blood. This is um, the notes that will be that will be loaded on the site. This shows um, copulation or fertilization, where you have the erect penis um, inserted into the vagina, and sperm and semen pass into the vagina, and the sperm swim up to the fallopian tube or the oviduct. If an ovum is in the oviduct, then fertilization can take place. And here we go. Remember that a penis is firm and erect because blood has filled the spaces in erectile tissue. And the semen contains millions of sperm. <clears throat> and again, this diagram that you've seen so many times, where you have the sperm are deposited into the vagina. They swim towards the fallopian tube and you have fertilization. These drawings, you should be able to draw them and sketch them for yourself and label them. Now there's a drawing that I have down here somewhere. Here it is. Uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but in only one of these can fertilization occur. Occur. So let's look at A. In A, we have sperm in the uter in the uterus, and the other, and, but the egg is still in the ovary. So we would say that fertilization cannot occur here, because in order for fertilization to come to cut to occur, ovulation has to be have occurred, and um, the egg has to be present in the fallopian tube. Here in the second diagram B, you see what how it usually represents a tubal ligation or some kind of blockage in the fallopian tube. So even though you have sperm present, the sperm cannot swim to the ovary, to the ovule, if the ovule was present, because <clears throat> um, it can't get through the tube. In tubal ligation, that is a form of um, trying of con contraception, the tubes are what they call tied or they're blocked surgically and so sperm can't get to the egg. Um, then in C, you have an egg here and a sperm and sperm present, so fertilization can take place. In D, there's no sperm so no fertilization can take place. Here we go. These are two very common um, drawings in BGCSE. They may show a bigger fetus, but you must be able to label all of the parts. So you start this, um, this is not right. <laughs> The vagina is down here. This is the cervix. Then I'm going to have to change this diagram. So you have the amniotic fluid, your amniotic sac, and remember they act as a protection, the shock, shock, shock absorbers. You bump against it, and it's around in the fluid, cushioning it. You have your fetus and your umbilical cord going towards your placenta. Then here we have your maternal blood in this pool or little lake of blood here, like they say. And notice they're not actually interact. But the baby's blood is coming from here. And you have the umbilical vein with a, a single umbilical vein with the oxygenated blood. And you have your umbilical arteries, two of them, with your deoxygenated blood and carrying wastes. So the umbilical vein will carry oxygen and food. The umbilical artery will carry carbon dioxide and other wastes such as urea. It's great to have you here again, people. I'll uh, see you next week when we talk about birth. And we'll get to find out all about how twins are formed and how to take care of yourself during pregnancy.
Bye. Thanks again. Had a good time.